announcements, let us invite Steve Huss uh, to introduce our uh, panel. You met Steve yesterday, uh, Vice President and Chief Catalyst with World Vision, and he will introduce our panel speakers. We will also be making this a question and answer session at the conclusion. And one of the things we'd like to do to facilitate that as the session goes on, rather than lose sight of the question that comes up, why don't you write out the question? And then when we have the Q&A session, that'll make sure that the questions are incredibly clear. It'll help our speakers also relate to them. And we'll get to that and hopefully have a lot of good time for that at the conclusion of the session. Um, as I was getting ready to come here, I was actually approached by someone who said, oh, you're going to the Holy Land. Have you seen Schindler's List? I've seen it a couple of times. Um, okay, hold that thought. I got on the plane. The people next to me were talking about the Holocaust and about knowing people who had actually survived that event. That took up about 10 of the hours of my 11-hour flight. When I arrived, I went to exchange money. When I got the 20 shekel note, I noticed a very moving picture of a concentration camp and people with bands on their arms, signifying a very important event for people who live here. When I opened my newspaper, as our vice president was here, the picture on the front page was of them taking a tour of Yad Vashem. Obviously another uh, important event for the people who were inviting him in to talk with leaders here. The Holocaust. You almost couldn't have a meeting like this in which we look at the evangelical church and the issues relating to the land without also mentioning the Holocaust and how do we relate to that. Let me first say what this session is not. This will not be a debate debating the historicity of the event itself, although there are some neighbors of this country who might want to debate that. Treblinka, Dachau, Auschwitz are not up for debate. These things happen. Unless we wonder if they could happen today, Rwanda, Bosnia, Kampuchea, Darfur, these are significant, sobering reminders that the darkness of the human heart goes very deep and is still resident. But I'd like to bring up the question of Francis Schaeffer that he continued to ask during his life and times with us. How should we then live knowing this event? What do we do with that? And so the title is apt, The Holocaust and the Evangelical Church. And we really have two communicators today that really, I mean, if you were to search the world to try and figure out who would you bring, uh, I just need to salute the folks who have organized this event. They found them. Uh, I'd like to introduce the first one. We're going to do this in the form of a, of a one person will get up and share, and then we'll have another introduction. The second person will share it, and then we'll open it, open, open it up to the rest of us for some question and answer. Our first speaker is Manfred, Dr. Manfred Cole. Now, uh, he, he gets the award, by the way, for the latest arrival. He uh, just got here two hours ago from China via Hong Kong and Germany. Uh, we have caffeinated him. We've, uh, we've laced his water, uh, so he is ready to go. Um, it was so many fascinating things about our communicator this morning. International guest born during the period under discussion in Germany. Uh, seasoned theologically and academically, he received his degrees from Harvard and Gordon-Conwell. And a variety of backgrounds. Uh, First Congregational Church of Middleborough, Massachusetts, actually one of the oldest churches in the United States, near and dear to my heart. He spent 18 years with World Vision in Africa and Central Europe, actually opened up our office in Central Europe, and then 18 years with Overseas Council, and many of you know that's that wonderful organization that makes sure that theological education continues in many places where it's hard to bring up institutions like this. He told me, he said, I've been on 350 theological institutional campuses, so if you want to go and debate that subject, he's ready for you. Uh, I don't dare anyone to do that, by the way. M happily married, two boys, six grandchildren. Please welcome Manfred Cole.
I'm indeed very honored and thankful that I can share with you this morning. Having said so, so much already, it is not your hearing that has a problem, it is my accent. <laughs> so don't worry. The first speaker was just perfect. His English was beautiful. <laughs> well, mine is not, which gives me the great advantage you have to listen more carefully. <laughs> the Holocaust and the evangelical movement from German pietism to Palestinian Christians, a period of 350 years. Let me begin with some definition. The word Holocaust is of Greek origin and means sacrifice by fire. It has been used to describe the terrible time in Nazi Germany prior to and during the Second World War when some six million Jews were eliminated, as well as uncountable gypsies and prisoners of war, homosexuals, communists, socialists, mentally and physical disabled persons, and many, many others. The Nazis who came to power in Germany in January of 1933 believed that Germans were rationally superior and anyone deemed inferior was an alien threat to the purity of the German racial community. The account of what happened in the 1930s and 1940s in concentration camps and gassing facilities, the final solution as it was called, is well known and documented by countless eyewitnesses. Only a fool would question or deny these facts. The term Holocaust is rightly used in connection with the atrocity of Nazi Germany. But it also describes a Holocaust mentality, a Holocaust philosophy, even a religious belief regarding the supposed superiority of one race leading to a desire and determination to destroy everything and everything that could interfere with achievement or semblance of perfection. This mentally finds expression in the most extreme forms of evil, expressed in the worst form of hatred. It can be seen in a person, a tribe, a people or a nation that believes itself to be superior to all others. The mass killings of Stalin's Russia, Armin's Uganda, Pol Pot, Cambodia, or Hussein's Iraq are some of the most well-known examples of our century. There have been and there still are uncountable of other expression of a Holocaust mentality. The people of Darfur, the people of West Africa, the people of Palestine, and in many other areas around the world today, they experience Holocaust in the hands of fellow human beings who consider themselves superior or even chosen by God. The evangelical movement, and allow me to, to speak a little bit about the history of the last 350 years to understand how the evangelical movement helped the cause of Nazi Germany. The term pietism is to be understood not merely or even primarily as a movement in church history in Central Europe from 1675 to 1750. Even more important, it is of force within the stream of global Protestantism to the present day. Its origin and development can be seen in Puritan piety and the mystical spiritualism of some of the radical reformers, and according to the historian Ritschl, even as far back as medieval monastic mysticism. The publication in 1675 of Spener's Pia Deserteria, the platform, the programmschrift of pietism, 
is historically accepted as the beginning of pietism, and today even eventualism. Only a few years prior to the publication of the Pia Deserteria, Spener, a Lutheran pastor in Frankfurt, Germany, began to gather the believers in his weekly Collegia Pietatis, the purpose of which was to provide individuals with a more spiritual edification than they would be able to receive from the Sunday worship service alone. Today, even 350 years later, this practice is still carried out in the Bible study fellowship meetings known in Germany as the Gemeinschaftsstunden, the fellowship hours. August Hermann Franke, the great pedagogue and founder of the Collegium Fidio Biblicum in Leipzig and the first pietistic institution in Halle, is recognized as the second patriarchal figure of pietism. Franke differentiated almost to the extreme between the natural man and the born-again man, between the outer and the inner, between the mere service knowledge and the real inner experience, between Christians in name only and the Christians marked by the experience of his or her inner life. The contribution of Sinzendorf the tolerant, ecumenical, and mission-oriented aristocrat who was immortalized in the work of Hernhut, the Brüdergemeinschaft, the Brother Church, is to be seen as the Christocentric pietism of Hernhut pietism. For Zinzendorf, the blood of Christ and the spirit of love was all important. In this, Zinzendorf emphasized mysticism almost to the extreme. And one may cite the example in his concept of the bride of Christ and the passion. And finally, radical pietism, the extreme group, should also be mentioned as part of the tradition, as well as the Schwabian pietists, the Württemberg movement, which was influenced by all the others. However, the Schwabian movement is significant that it was less dependent on the sponsorship of the nobility and therefore it was more a people's movement from the outset. The voice of the quiet ones, die Stimme der Stillen, is an appropriate title for the Schwabian pietists. Each form of pietism, Reformed, Lutheran, Hernhut, or Schwabian, suffered a decline following the initial success, but in the late 18th and in the 19th century, a newly revitalized pietistic movement the Erweckungsbewegung sprang up with a special emphasis on revival and evangelism. Out of this revival grew numerous mission organizations and fellowship groups, most of which are combined in the Gnadauer Verband, an organizational structure holding them together in a very loose way. For nearly 350 years, the pietist movement has transcended nationally and confessional boundaries and made unquestionable vital contribution in the edification of believers, not only in the realm of Bible teaching, preaching, religious education, literature, and hymnology, but also in the field of social outreach in numerous areas of mission at home and abroad. Above all, pietism has created within the individual believers a deep personal awareness of his or her relationship with God. In response to the criticism that their faith is too subjective and based too largely on emotionalism, pietists always point to their good works, their praxis pietatis. They thus fail to recognize or appreciate the extent to which their own inner experience replaces Christian dogma and is evaluated to become the criterion of truth and the norm according to which everything, spiritual or non-spiritual, is judged. While the experience of rebirth, the central theme of three and a half centuries of pietism, created in the individual such a strong conviction of his or her inner newness, 
that they were unable to overcome their fear and failures, even often logic and even common sense. This is true whether pietism, pietism is interpreted according to the formula of Spener, are you still born again? Or Franke, are you converted? Or Sinzendorf, do you feel the crucified one? The pietist who is clearly branded by born again considered himself or herself free from the world and able to concentrate on developing his or her own inner life. According to Pietist theology, the inner life, the life indwelt by Christ, will result not only in a better man, but also in a better church and ultimately in a better world. And that, of course, was one of the foundational statements of Nazi thinking. However, this individualism, subjectivism, this personal overemphasis, overemphasis on Imatio Christi forced the pietist to live in a particular combination of humility and pride, a self abasement and self exaltation, submissiveness and a tendency to negativism, reluctance to assume political responsibility and a readiness to criticize. Each pietist became his own prophet, priest, and king, prompting Karl Barth to say, for the pietist, man himself came to be a sacrament. Pietism, the executor of the Reformation and the reconstructor of the early Christianity, was never, according to its own evaluation, a united or structurally organized body. It is rightly called the independent movement of spiritualism. The following statement expressed the pietist position towards the official church in Germany, which they even claim today we are in the church, if possible with the church, but never under the church. From the beginning, the pietistic movement, like the evangelical movement in Central Europe today, can be best described as being a Bible-centered ministry existing parallel to the official Protestant church. Let me now focus on some characteristics common to both pietists and evangelicals historically, both before and during the time of Nazi Germany, and to some extent, even today. These characteristics include positive and negative elements, from Spener onward, the pietist always had a hope for better times. A chiselastic trend that pietism shared with the early church. An overemphasis on eschatology was and still is a basic emphasis, and many of the developments in pietism have to be theologically and psychologically interpreted in the light of its future expectation. For Luther and the Reformation, the emphasis was on justification based on the Book of Romans, where the pietists and the evangelicals tend more to focus on eschatology based on the Book of Revelation and Daniel. It is of great significance that for pietists and evangelicals, the evangelizations of the Jews is closely connected with or even part of their eschatology. It seems that the Jewish question, the conversion of the Jewish people, was and still is a barometer of their eschatology. Today, a large segment of the pietists and evangelical groups pray daily for the conversion of the Jews as a nation and for the total liberation of the holy city of Jerusalem, believing that these events are absolutely requirements for the coming of God's kingdom. Anything interfering with that conversion of the Jews and the rebuilding of Jerusalem is to be rejected or condemned. They believe that all support for Israel today, in whatever form, helps in the process of achieving the imminent conversion of the Jewish nation. With the mission of the Jews stands or falls to a large extent their beliefs in Christ's power, even within themselves, 
as well as their hope for Christ's final victory and soon expected return. Spener's concept of the conversion of the Jews and their insertion into Christian community was far-reaching. Spener saw in the conversion of the Jews, just as in the born-again experience, evidence of God's direct intervention. He approached the Jews not with a strict messianic claim, but rather he attempted to present the gospel to the Jews on their own terms as law, as in the Sermon on the Mount, and as holiness. The conversion and baptism of the Jews were seen as a model for the born-again experience, as factual evidence that through re rebirth, man can change completely. Another aspect of pietism was the, was the stress on education, especially re with regards to the extensive cultivation of the language in the middle of the middle and the lower classes. Since education was regarded as primarily for edification, the pietistic schools focused on the language of German. The pietist emphasized the use of language of the common man, especially if one wanted to reach the masses and bring the gospel closer to their daily life experience. Language was seen as a creative power given to man, and through its use in a pietistic framework, especially in the edification literature, it was elevated to become the expression of the inner essence of a nation, the point that the mother language became something religious and divine, like a sacrament. The German language became the heart of the nation. The idea was basically that human speech is part of creation and the same level as other aspects of creation. God himself is therefore the prime source of language, especially since he himself was revealed in the Logos. One can see clearly how the emotional, subjective, and mystical feelings of the pietists were involved in the development of the sacrament of language. Also, the leader of the Leitman also stressed the use of the German language. They did not reach the heart of the people. The importance given to music, to hymnology, to art in Germany is an indication to the extent to which the pietistic religious enthusiasm and the emphasis on the expression of one's own inner feeling has influenced society as a whole. The pietistic inner experience of the individual was transformed from a national level to, from a personal level to a national level. The religious value placed on the German language and culture and the awe with which they were regarded, the view that education of the inner man would eliminate social distinction and a new self-awareness and sense of individual importance combined with the religious enthusiasm of the pietism would not only lay the groundwork for German nationalism, but to a very great extent carry it through to its completion. Pietism contributed yet another idea in the development of nationalism, namely that of revival. Pietism recognized that each individual has to be conformed with the gospel as an answer to his lost sinful condition until the moment at which the second and real birth takes place. In the denial of one's own will, God's presence is experienced in a subjective manifestation and man can live in victory. The pattern of revival, rebirth, self-denial, holiness and victory the only valid pattern of life ever recognized by the pietists was transferred from the religious to the secular realm and there further developed in various details by the so-called enlightened pietists. The entire patriotic revival of Nazi Germany seems to have been modeled after the pietistic concept of the conversion of the individual. The nation as a whole recognized its sin, its social distinction, indecisiveness, lack of loyalty and responsibility. 
And therefore, the realization of the dream of the inner fatherland came up. This recognition of sin and the longing for fulfillment led to the rebirth of the nation. And as the national spirit overcame the power, the enthusiasm and mystical self-denial resulted in the achievement of what was considered a national holiness. This concept of the fatherland, the place where you belong, the place you can claim as your own because it was so essential to the pietistic thinking. The land of the fathers was and still is of extreme values. And it prov provides a sense of identity and security. One can see why so many pietists and evangelicals transfer their beliefs of the fatherland in endorsing the claim of Israel to have their own land of their fathers. In avenge, avenge <coughs> evangelicalism, as in pietism, there was also a tendency towards perfectionism and absolutism a tendency reinforced in the beliefs of the inner experience of the individual, the perfect Christ within. This attitude combined with a sense of responsibility to educate and evangelize, and the emphasis given to the divine and the German language, culture, and fatherland, led to the belief that Germany was superior to all other nations. It was believed that whatever came from Germany must be great and good. Germany was considered to be the pulse of Europe. The pietistic concept of industry and social consciousness, of marriage and family life, the vitality and the importance of youth and of blind obedience to the spiritual advisors, to mention only a few, all helped to advance the cause of German nationalism. Pietism, in imparting to German nationalism its own unique characteristic, was to a very large extent responsible for shaping the mind of the German nation, particularly at a time when the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the defeat of the First World War was viewed as a disruption of the model they believed in. The pietist patriotic self-awareness had to be reawakened. A new inner experience had to take place. The God of the nation himself would have to step in. If not, all previous developments and achievements and blessings would remain incomplete or even regarded as failure. The hope of renewal became finally the reality in 1933 when the new leadership of the Nazis promised to take away the disappointment and disgrace on the people. Hitler was the man of the hour. He became prophet, priest, and king, especially to those deprived by inflation and unemployment. The German masses rejoiced. At the beginning, virtually all pietistic and evangelical groups in Germany supported Hitler. Let me repeat that. At the beginning, when Hitler came to power, all pietistic groups and all evangelical groups supported Hitler. And a few warning voices, mainly from courageous members of the official Protestant church, were not heard. By the time the Nazis began to put their Holocaust philosophy into practice, it was too late. And this disaster was imminent. Those who continued to speak out were ignored, regarded as preachers of doom, and not taken seriously. However, that small group, that the confessing church was trying to, to get the pietists to be combined to help them, to support them, they did not. The pietists were unwilling to take a clear stand and because they felt that a confessing church was led to a large extent by liberal theologians, they did not join. Even later on, when total resistance became necessary in order to save the lives of millions of innocent people, the pietistic evangelical groups failed to act. One can only speculate what might have happened if the warning voices had been louder, stronger, and more convincing. Could they have helped to avoid the catastrophe? 
Although the pietists and evangelical groups eventually recognized that they had been blind and guilty of indecisiveness, and although they repented in various ways after the collapse of the Third Reich, the sense of guilt remained. It seems that the pietists and evangelicals have closed that chapter of their own history prematurely without satisfactorily dealing with it. In our time, now decades after the defeat of Nazi Germany, the majority of the pietists and evangelical groups support Israel without reservation. Now, the whole thing is shifting. They rejoice that finally the Jews can reclaim what they consider to be their own land of the fathers, and that with the help from the West, they have become very prosperous. All these groups claim that they stand with Israel because of their biblical understanding of the Abrahamic covenant. It is not their only motivation. They are also moved by a deep sense of guilt and the need to make restitution for the treatment of the Jews in Nazi Germany. Pietists and evangelicals in Nazi Germany did not see the total picture until it was too late. The unquestioning support of the state of Israel today shows again that they don't see the whole picture until it will be too late. The current situation in the Middle East is a situation similar to that prior to and during Nazi Germany. In this case, two groups of people, Jews and Muslim Arabs, are guilty of developing a serious Holocaust mentality, creating imminent danger of another Holocaust catastrophe. Here again, many evangelicals throughout the world fail to see the total picture. And here again, the warning voices of the people in the middle are for the most part not being heard. These very small, quiet warning voices have their core, I believe, within the Christians of Palestine, who point again and again to the atrocity that are being committed daily by both sides, the Jews and Muslim Arabs. What I'm trying to, to show in that very short summary, the pietists and evangelicals in in Central Europe, supported the development of a national development of Nazi Germany, even if it meant to destroy millions of people, because they only saw one side. And today we have a similar situation. They only see one side. They don't want to see the total picture. I believe the role of the Palestinian Christians in the middle, like the confessing church, like the ones that speak out against it, has to be emphasized much, much more. Let me close with seven challenges. The warning voices must become louder and more strategic. Our conference, like others before, are noteworthy, but compared to the support that Israel receives through their conferences and contracts and all the evangelicals that support them, it is in no relations. And the same can be said in relation to the support received by the Muslims from the Arab world. Two, more dialogue with a clear biblical theological background should take place. The theology of the land, the fulfillment of Abrahamic covenant through Christ's atonement, the New Testament focus on the heavenly Jerusalem, the Pauline emphasis on the promised land as a universal promise related to the cosmos, and many, many other topics have to be addressed, have to be written up, 
have to be produced as textbooks for every theological schools around the world who is training the next generation of Christian leaders. Number three, the modern confessing church, as it was 50 years ago, the modern confessing church, a group of key individual leaders should, create, should be created to give the warning voices more substance. The marketing and public relations agency of the media, including the evangelical media, must be won over to be friends in order for them to become advocates. It was amazing, on my trip here, I, I picked up the newspaper, it's the only time I have time to read newspaper from, from the first page to the last one, and here on page two, a whole article Every traveler to the Holy Land should become an ambassador. That was written by one of the Zionist groups. Where is our statement in that regard? Tour guides, tourist information need to be more specific in painting the total picture, not just the one. They need to include Palestine Christians in a realistic and positive way. The hundreds of thousands of evangelicals who come to the Holy Land every year must be won over and be convinced by the warning voices that there is a different point of view before they return home. And they can be a force for multiplication in their Bible studies, churches, and seminaries. Number five, more courage is needed in answering specific questions about the future. One can see the example of Jesus' harsh rebuke in the discussion with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The minds of these two disciples, which I believe was a man and his wife, was focusing on the future of the land of Israel. But Jesus said, O oh, foolish of and slow of heart, don't you know that everything is focused on Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy? We have to speak out much clearer and louder and determined. In the light of the incredible injustice on every side, Jews, Muslims, Arabs, and Christians, becomes more relevant than ever before. Peacemaking goes much, much further than just peacekeeping. Evangelicals today must be challenged to take the task of peacemaking, and the best place to start is right here among the Palestine Christians who are the center of the greatest conflict of our time. And we should be part of that process. You know the well-known expression, peace be with you, shalom aleikum and salam aleikum, the Hebrew and the Arab respectively greetings, is well known throughout the Middle East and the hate is just the underlying motif. Now the Holocaust is on the horizon. And those in the middle, the Palestinian Christians, the little group can make the difference. If they continue to practice the commandment of our Lord to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, this small group like yeast must expand many hundred folds so that the voices for real peace and real justice and real reconciliation infiltrates not only the mainstream of evangelicalism, but becomes a force that the entire Christian church must hear in such a way that we, as well as the Jews and the Muslims, have to reckon with it. Thank you, Manfred. On a wall in Dachau, as you leave the 
uh, introduction area going in to see where, in fact, uh, prisoners of that time were kept is a small saying. I believe it's by Santana. I was trying to recall this from memory, but something to the extent that he who forgets the past is slated to repeat it. And I can't think of a more important topic in the way in which you addressed it in terms of understanding our own role today in light of these events. Our next speaker today is Sammy Awad. I think you get to the end of a conference like this and a place like this, and many of you are muttering to yourself, I just wish I could be in Awad. Uh, this family, incredible. Sammy serves as the executive director of the Holy Land Trust. We've got many people who are associated with that great organization here with us during the conference. And so there are other things that he does, travel and encounter programs, a see and do, so to speak, a get up close and personal. Some of the people who are with us today have already experienced some of that with his organization. Uh, the Palestine News Network, an independent news agency, is also something that he's involved in as well as Al Kul TV. Most importantly, I think if you pushed him, he would say, I'm happily married to a lovely wife with two girls, two and seven. And yes, I am Bashar's son. Please uh, welcome Samuel Watt. Okay. Thank you for this introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be with you today and an honor to speak to such a distinguished delegation at this conference. You guys are so important that I actually wrote my speech for today. <laughs> that has to mean something. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to share with you today. Uh, and it, was, it is an honor to be on stage with incredible godly men, such as Manfred Cole and Steve Haas. And thank you very much for being here. I come to, to you today claiming no experience or expertise on the issue at hand. If you asked me five years ago to stand up here or in any conference and talk about the Holocaust, my reactions would have been no, and I would have run away. So don't you, you wouldn't even try to argue with me to speak on such an issue. But now I come to you with a deep heart and desire to share with you my story, or I can even call it my pilgrimage in wanting to look deeper as a Palestinian, as a follower of Jesus, into the core issues that have allowed and continue to allow violence, fear, hatred, mistrust, and resignation to be the main approaches and mechanisms of how we Palestinians and Israelis are dealing with each other. I am fully convinced that what we as Palestinians experience on the hands of the occupying force is only the product, not the goal, of something deeper that lies in the Israeli Jewish community, and especially those who came from Europe, and based on their experiences in Europe. This, of course, does not mean that I justify or excuse any acts of violence, but declare that when we are able to understand deeply the causes and not the effects, then we are able to develop and engage in the right actions and in speaking the right words that would allow for violence to stop, racial and ethnic discrimination to end, and for healing to take place, and for new realities to be established. This personal pilgrimage if I may call it that again, took me to Poland a few years ago. Took me to the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergenau. And I have been again there since, so I've been there twice, and I will definitely go again. And what was my experience? I was there as part of a retreat. Twice it was a 10-day retreat with groups of activists from all around the world 
Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, you name them, they were there in what was called, it's called a bearing witness retreat, to bear witness to the tragedy that happened to the Jewish community. And we would spend every day there from eight in the morning to late at night in prayers, meditation, reflection, dialogue, talking with each other and experiencing as close as we can possibly can the tragedy that happened to the Jewish community and other communities in these death camps. To walk in the bunkers, to walk in the chambers where people were gassed to death, to see the ovens where they were, bodies were burnt, the lakes where their ashes were dumped. That was a shock for me. At one point, three of us, an American Jew, a Muslim from Turkey, and me as a Palestinian Christian requested to stay in one bunker for an entire night, and we were granted that permission. And it was called the children's bunker. I don't know if any of you have been there or have seen it, but this is where the bunker that they kept the children either before they send them to death or that may have had a potential uh, to work even in a very young age and it was a cold November night in Poland when we stayed there and we were ready we had our coats we had our sleeping bags we had everything ready and we just were there imagining these children bare bone naked children not having anything on such a night and it was another one of those powerful experiences that we had and that I had personally. On the wall of the bunkers, there are drawings that were drawn by the children themselves, and they're still preserved until this day. Children who were suffering, drawing children who were playing and having joy on the walls of this uh, bunker. As I said, this was a shock for me. And this was a historic shock for me. But in Auschwitz, I also experienced a present and future shock as well. If you remember, you know, Schindler's List has been brought out, the movie, the, the train track that goes into Birkenau, where an entire train would go in before they unloaded uh, the people that were in it. And we would be sitting in circles doing our prayers and meditation right on the grass where the train track was. And one thing that we saw continuously every single day was groups of Israeli children that were brought by Israeli guides to visit and to experience the death camps. They would come in with Israeli flags around, wrapped around their backs, singing very patriotic songs. And they would go around in this one day to visit all of the sites I mentioned. And then they would sit with their guide in a circle to talk about their experience. And the guide would begin to explain the situation. And you could imagine these children, maybe most of them had grandparents, great uncles and aunts that were killed, maybe even in Auschwitz itself or any of the death camps that existed around Europe. So they're going through this trauma and shock 13 to 16 year old children going through this trauma and shock of what they experienced and then these guides are telling them guess what that's not it it's not over this is not just our history this is our present and our future and these guys I'm sitting next to a circle as a Palestinian listening to Israeli guides telling them that if given the opportunity, the Palestinians are going to do the same thing to us as what the Nazis did. And this is why we have to be strong. This is why we have to be in the military. This is why we have to do what we do, because we want to prevent it again. And the Palestinians, Arabs and Muslims, they would use these three words, are going to do the same thing to us as what the Nazis did to your grandparents. So you can imagine the shock on the children as well after they hear that. This is their future as well. And of course, they come back here. They return here from that shock. Immediately after they finish high school, they are given the only tools of dealing with this potential 
threat, which is weapons. The Israeli military. This is the only way you could deal with this is by being violent. By being violent towards you that even might be perceived as a threat. And the soldier now who's gone through that trauma experience now is trained in this weaponry all of a sudden is also put at a checkpoint inside the West Bank between Palestinian areas to deal with that potential threat as well. And that was the shock for me of the present and the future. This experience transformed my life and even I want to say transformed in how I look at nonviolence. As a person who's been active and studying nonviolence since I was 16 years old, or even before that, with my uncle Mubarak, who is with us, I had always thought of nonviolence as a means of resisting the oppression of the other. Nonviolence as a means to even engage in justifying my demands and my rights and my legitimate needs as a human, but to express it in nonviolence where I don't hurt physically the other. Now, it is not just about resisting oppression, but it's also engaging in actions that heal those who cause it from their own fear and their own manipulation of fear. And I want to distinguish here between the term fear and manipulation of fear. Because yes, in many regards, fear is real and it exists. But we also have to deal with those even within Israeli society, who are manipulating the fear for their own political or ideological needs. And of course, all of this is covered publicly by the term they call security. But all the underlying is fear and manipulation of fear. How do I deal with a person who is really afraid? And how to deal with a person who is manipulating fear are two different questions. I believe that it is our role and responsibility as Palestinians, and I want to specifically say the Palestinian Christian community, to take responsibility in this issue. I truly feel that the world has completely ignored and neglected the fear that exists in the Jewish community. The world has thought by giving money, and giving political legitimacy and giving political power a surplus, a surplus of power that everything will be okay. So the challenge for us as Palestinian Christians and especially within the evangelical community, what do we do in order to provide lasting healing to this land and all those who live in it? And I have several points on this. First, we need to realize that we have used a language in the past to describe the issue in a way that only creates opportunities for deeper victimization and violence. One of the famous lines you hear Palestinians say is that they are doing to us what happened to them. They are the new Nazis. And these are, you know, very emotional and very strong words. But this line, which I have even used myself in the past, I have discovered that it only creates the dead ends. It allows for both communities to fall into deeper claims of victimization and argumentation. So we begin to argue, are they doing this to us? Are they doing the same thing to us or not? And they argue, no, we're not doing the same thing to you as what happened to us. And we completely ignore and neglect the fact. And this, of course, creates for bitterness, revenge, anger, excuses, and justifications. Just imagine for a moment if we create the distinction in our language alone. And as Palestinians, we begin to use a line something like, they are treating us in a way that was born out of their horrific experiences that they had. For me, this allows for possibilities. It allows for recognition of pain and suffering not blaming the victims or the perpetrators, and allows for actions 
that address both our and their pain and suffering. Language is important. Second, it's very important for us to speak the truth as the truth, not to allow our ego, interpretations, justifications, even opinions to lead us into affecting the truth as the truth. We sometimes engage in falsehood because we allow our anger to take over and distort us from God's truth. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul said, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. It is vital for us as the Palestinian Christian community to be a voice of truth in the suffering, not only to be speakers on behalf of our people, but all peoples around the world, including the Jewish people who suffered and continue to suffer. My personal opinion is that they have to also, they have also not had the opportunity, as I said, to engage in healing. So let us speak the truth as the truth. Third, we must not let anything or anyone intimidate or lead us to lose focus or be off track with being in and answering to God's will in our lives and the lives of others. We must not create in our words or deeds anything that allows for bitterness or hatred to be planted in the hearts of any other human. In the same letter, Paul writes, get rid of bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other, just as Christ God forgave you. This does not mean that there will be no anger and no feelings of being violated. But let us challenge ourselves through God's grace to always seek the ways that allow for inner healing in order to engage in words and actions that fully and completely put an end to those actions that cause bitterness and anger. Healing is important. The fourth point, seek the justice of God for us and our people and for the Jewish people. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles, according to the Psalms. And in our seeking of God's justice and God's kingdom, then everything shall be added unto us. We have to be fully aligned in what we seek as justice and how this fits into God's plan for justice for all of humanity. Yes, as Palestinians, we seek justice and we call for justice. And we need to challenge ourselves as the Palestinian Christian community, how aligned is this justice with God's justice and peace for all. The last point, my favorite point, engage in continuous acts of love to your oppressor. For it is not a choice we have as followers of Jesus to love the other and to love the enemy, but it is a commandment that we are to abide in. I will not accept any argument that says that engaging in actions of expressing God's love to the other undermines or underestimates our goal and aspirations as Palestinians, or to make us look as if we are weak and vulnerable. It is only in strength that you could express love. And for me, I do interpret these acts of love through my involvement in nonviolence and nonviolent action, and in speaking words that allow for this deep healing to take place. We must love and must forgive and must engage in opening real opportunities for the other to also love and engage. 
and forgive. Too many apologies, too much compensation, and too much guilt has been spread, and not enough forgiveness and closure have happened. So the five points for me are truth, healing, justice, love, and nonviolence. And my call at the end to the local Palestinian evangelical community, as Dr. Manfred has so perfectly said, it is time for us to take lead in this work. To develop within the experience of the Holocaust and the experience of our Nakbi, the catastrophe, not the undermining or surrendering of our legitimate aspirations as Palestinians, but engage in the actions and the words and develop our theological understanding for the Holy Land that heals and creates possibility. Possibilities for this sacred land to be a beacon for God's love, mercy, and thanks to him, his continuous forgiveness. And I pray this in God's grace. Thank you. going to go to a time of interaction now uh, to allow you to ask questions. Again, we would ask that these be questions. If you have a, it's a fairly emotional topic, obviously, as most of our topics are during this conference. If there is a question that you have that you'd like to ask, uh, please step up to one of the mics and then we'll go till roughly about 20, 25 after and then we'll close. Okay, so we've got about 20 minutes in which we can uh, deal with some of the questions that you might have, either on the history as we've heard it, uh, pietism and its impact on national socialism and actually the rise and some of those uh, modern elements that we actually see maybe even today as they bear forth, but then also some of the present experience that we have today. Any questions? Please. Sammy, uh, you mentioned the encouragement in continuous acts of love to your oppressor. Could you give us some examples of how you see that happening? Yes. Um, one of the things I talk about always is uh, as we Palestinians have to travel around the West Bank. As you know, we always have to go through checkpoints. Checkpoints manned by these young Israeli soldiers. Now, if I go up to a soldier and say, you know, give it to me. You know you want it. I love you, man. <laughs> I think he'll have a different reaction uh, than what I want out of it. But this is where I believe that nonviolence comes and plays a very important role. Uh, part of the work that we do as an organization, and I'm proud to say that this is not the work of Holland Land Trust, but the work of many, many members and organizations in the Palestinian community, is engaging in acts of nonviolence as protests and demonstrations. And for me, this is the closest at this time that we could get to these soldiers. And for me, this is the important target group. Yes, there are many Israelis that are engaging in peace work and justice work and who understand this, but how do we as... ...these soldiers, when we are engaging in these actions, I believe that opportunities are created, opportunities are built. I've seen soldiers break down and cry. They had all the weapons that they needed to suppress us, and they couldn't use any of them. I would talk to a soldier once in, in, in Al-Khadr, which is a village right here. He, he cried so much he fell on the ground, he couldn't hold himself up. 
That for me is a miracle, and that for me is an act of love between me and him. I have a question for both of you, actually. There's uh, something that someone described as reconciliation chic, in which lead leaders of different nations, leaders of different religious groups, finding their way to groups that have been harmed or actions that were taken that, that, that hurt a people group or a, a organization, and then making a, an apology over something that happened maybe not even in their lifetime. Um, do you see an importance of that I would say uh, to you, Manfred, with relation to evangelicals and, and maybe what happened in, in and around National Socialism, but even today with Palestinians, with Jews, and then uh, going over to you, Sammy, you made a comment at the end, a little bit of a comment about an apology, etc. What are your views on that today? Manfred, I'll go to you first. I have the, I have the privilege of uh, living in Nova Scotia, Canada. And I was told that about 200 years ago, the British soldiers came and uh, took thousands of, of Canadians by force and shipped them down to the States as more or less as slaves. That was 200 years ago. Three years ago, the Queen of England came and for the first time she apologized. She couldn't do anything. It was 300 years ago. But she apologized for her country and for her people many, many, many generations ago. It was one of the most healing and one of the most exciting moment that a chapter of real hurt came to a close. I believe many of the evangelical pietistic groups have to do something similar. It was our fathers and our grandparents who got involved in that. But we have to admit, it was wrong. And they did something wrong. And we should ask for forgiveness and bring it to a close. Yes, and, and I think this is the important point. Uh, as a Palestinian, it frustrates me continuously when, for example, every single new pope has to declare an apology for what the Vatican did. Or every new German president or prime minister has to declare an apology for what happened in Germany. And, and for me, in these statements, the, the core value of the apology is lost when the apology does not allow for closure to happen, when the apology is done just for the sake of a statement and no forgiveness is reached. I have not heard an Israeli politicians, for example, in a time of apology saying, yes, we forgive you and we are ready to move forward. We just take it as apology and also, let me just say it directly, and we'll take your money with it as well. So for me, apology cannot come out of guilt, cannot come out of fear. It has to come out of strength on both sides, the apologizer and the forgiver, to say now we are ready to close this file and move forward. Thank you. Thank you both for your talks. Um, Manfred, you said that you thought it's possible that another Holocaust is on the horizon, which raises the stakes very much in terms of how we should behave as Christians. Because of the very gross politics of Christian Zionism, many evangelicals who are hostile to Christian Zionism um, make the era, the old era of pietism that you point out, of retreating and focusing on a disembodied salvation, overemphasis of the so-called spiritual and escapist eschatology. How can we represent God's desire for an engaged, embodied, political people committed to living his way like the prophets called for and like the church in Acts lived in the face of empire, in the face today of very dark and very tangible principalities and powers. Could you, uh, don't, don't go away yet. Could you summarize that in a question? Yeah. 
I know it was a whole sermon, but just, just put, put, put it in a simple question that I can answer. Sure, that's my debut then. Um, yeah, what, what is our political calling? Uh, what is our calling to be an embodied community that engages power because we are embodied and we live in this world, um, rather than simply focusing on the next world? Can I go? No, 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 stay there, stay there. <laughs> the old educator is coming out, and I can see it. I think it is time that we evangelicals come to grips with the situation that if we don't take a stand, if we don't have a concerted effort to pray, if we don't have that mentality, as we heard from Sammy, of, of real reconciliation and, and forgiveness, there will be a major conflict here in the Middle East. It is on the horizon. It's getting more and more difficult. Uh, it is, it, it is a, a Holocaust mentality that is being developed, just as it was in, in Nazi Germany. And I think it is up to us to support a small little group right here, the Palestinian Christians, to stand with them, to uphold them, to be their spokesmen, to be their ambassadors all around the world, to, to, to make their voice heard. Because they're in the middle. They're, the, they're the, 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 the voice of the quiet ones. They're the, the confessing church of the 1930s and 40s in Central Europe. They're the ones who could make the difference. And I think it's up to us to really stand, stand with them and support them. I don't think there is a, a political statement needed. I think it's a spiritual issue. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. yes. Sammy, can you okay. comment on it as well? Uh, yeah, I, I also agree. Uh, I think this is a spiritual warfare and battle that we are in. And it is time to take a stand in this issue. It is time to break, especially in the evangelical churches in the West, those who know they need to break the barrier of fear that prevents them from talking and being a critical and reason, a reasonable voice uh, for peace. Uh, you, you've heard it and you'll hear it a lot where any person who speaks out is immediately labeled, not just uh, as a pro-Palestinian, but an anti-Semite or anti-Jewish or anti-Israeli. And, and it is time to, to stop this and to move forward. And when you see injustice happening, uh, you have no excuse but to, to deal with it in the, in, in the right way. And for me, it is the nonviolent way. So I'm not asking you to carry guns and sure. start shooting around, but, but really develop an approach where we are able to stand in love for the Israelis, not for fear from the Israelis. I think just to follow up, my, my kind of point related to the fact that people like Bonhoeffer didn't only pray, um, they also, well, Bonhoeffer tried to kill Hitler, um, and is there a physical engagement with the physical tools of power that's required, um, even just by putting ourselves in the way, in the way of violence and in the way of power, in order to um, stop its effect? Mm -hmm. well, just briefly, I would say that nonviolence is not an easy option. It is not the option of the weak or the resigned or the passive, let me say even. It is those who engage in nonviolence are the ones that are ready to stand in between those who are shooting and killing each other. It is those who engage in nonviolence that, as I said, are resisting those who engage in oppression, but at the same time, not just resisting for the sake of resisting, but resisting for the sake of healing. So it is very important, and nonviolence is not just an option for the Palestinian community to engage in. There are many Israelis who are engaging in this. Uh, many of you have heard, for example, about boycott campaigns towards Israel. 
Did anybody know that there is actually a boycott campaign from within Israel, by Israelis, calling for boycotting Israel globally? These are, these are the heroes uh, for me that we need to stand with and support. Thank you. I'd like to, to, to make one more comment. A few years ago, I, I was in this hotel right here. There was a dinner, it was a celebration uh, in connection with the Bethlehem Bible College. I was asked to be one of the speakers and I was sitting at the, the dinner table and there was a, a man sitting next to me. And uh, over dinner, I was so nervous to speak, so I, I tried to make a conversation and I asked him, what are you doing? Maybe you know the story, but if you have never heard it, uh, it will have an impact. It did in my life. And he told me that he had a chance to visit in, in Tel Aviv uh, two families who lost their children because of a bomb explosion. He met with them and talked with them. And, and then he went to the other side and met with the parents of the suicide bomber who blew him herself up to kill these children on that bus. He spoke with both groups because both were parents who lost their children. And then he said, I prayed for a long time to bring the two groups of parents together. And praise God, I brought them together. And they became friends, even to plant some olive trees together. Oh, I wish that all of us could be involved in such kind of a ministry. I want to say first that it's a huge privilege for me to be here with my sisters and brothers in Palestine, and also to listen to both of you. Uh, I think it's obvious for those who know the situation here that we not only have tensions between the Palestinians and the Israeli, but there is also a rift within the Christian community in Palestine, between um, evangelicals on one side and the historical churches, but also mainline Protestant churches. Often the charge of proselytism is given by the later against evangelicals. And being an evangelical myself, I tend to believe that is sometimes justified, often with the help of Western evangelicals coming to convert here, Catholics and Orthodox, because obviously they are not Christians, we think. My question is, what do you think that Palestinian evangelicals can do to bring reconciliation between themselves and the historical traditions? And also, what can Western Christians, and I address this to Mantra, what can Western Christians, especially evangelicals, both from the, Refor uh, the Radical Reformation, but also from mainline churches, can do to help bring healing to this rift? Thank you. I think before healing can take place, we have to uh, state the facts. I would love for us to, to be more involved in, in using the mass media to point out to the real issues. The story I just told you, I don't even know the name of the man who told me that story. Maybe he is here. Forgive me that I told you, told the story about you. But man, I told it to so many journalists and I have seen it in so many newspapers now. We have to use today's mechanism to, to, to make our cause known, to, to tell the churches, the Christians, and even the non-Christians, what the real issue is, and not just one side, and not just leave it up to certain people 
and leave it up to, to the ones who can uh, speak elo eloquently. We have to, to really make it known as far as possible. Be sure you pray first before you do it. But I believe uh, we, we should be much, much more on the, on the cutting edge of making the, the situation known, the needs known, and to, to support that small little group around here, which is much bigger than we think it is, the small little powerful group of Palestinian Christians, support them, help them, and, 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 and be a spokesman for them. Manfred, oh, did you want to speak to that, Sammy? Like on the Palestinian issue, or that was enough? If you would like to. Just very quickly, I, I just want to say, uh, uh, as my father mentioned yesterday, what your question is a core issue of this conference itself. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that you will be able to get this answer as part of this process. But one thing I want to say is that many times, Many times the Palestinian uh, Christian evangelical community feels and sees itself as in a defensive position addressing Western evangelical Christian actions and words that come out. Uh, so for example, somebody draws a cartoon in Sweden, immediately the assumption by, by the local traditional Christians or Muslim community that uh, this is what the evangelicals do. Somebody says a statement like you heard, uh, yesterday, my uncle Alex say, we have to defend uh, our position and our place in face of these things. So we're not getting the support from the uh, Western evangelical uh, community. Uh, and yes, there are issues, uh, there are deep rifts within the church in Palestine that need to be addressed. And I think we need help in this from the Western evangelical church. And the evangelical local church needs to be engaged in building relations and building trust and building respect within the local uh, Christian community and, and addressing the issue of fear, as you said, that we want to steal their members into our uh, churches. Have a real open debate and discussion with the local churches, how we could support them, how we could bring God's message of love to them and have these churches also be built up uh, in this Holy Land. We have time for these two questions right here, you and this gentleman here, and then we'll conclude. As an American evangelical, Manfred, I was very interested in, in the tie you made from pietism and the movement to nationalism. My question, I have a question for you and then a, qu a different question for you, Sammy. What do you see, Manfred, is the role of growing nationalism in the American Evangelical Church and how that ties to the whole topic here today. And then, Sammy, the role of racism in the American church and therefore its disposition, anti-Palestinian disposition. How do you guys see that, having worked with these things? I think it's a huge, huge issue that you are raising how the evangelical pietistic movement uh, was laying the groundwork and furthering the whole Nazi German uh, philosophy. We have to be very, very careful. Uh, it can happen anywhere. And we have to be quite, quite clear on, on God. And we need evangelical theologians who speak out to that. And we, we need people who, who, who address that issue to the next generation. We, we overlook the, the significance. As the seminary goes, so goes the church. If we don't deal with the people as they are trained to be the leaders for the next generation, there is the, the real issue that has to be addressed. I like to see much more attention being given to that point. And then very quickly, uh, you raise a very, very good question on the issue of racism. And one of the things, for example, that is very upsetting for me when I travel to the U.S. is the feeling that many Americans have that because Israelis are like us, we support them. Uh, and this is not just the issue of color of skin or the historic, what's called Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, but also the, the lifestyle 
that Israelis engage in and uh, having McDonald's and Burger King in Israel makes them all oh, they're like us so we are to support them and we are to stand with them uh, they are the representatives of the only democracy in the Middle East because they are like us uh, in the same way so, so this is a very deep-rooted issue and I think it's a very big challenge for us as Palestinians to be able to present uh, a very strong uh, alternative view, but not an alternative view that surrenders uh, to such uh, a racism. Uh, so it's, it's very deep and very powerful, but I think at the end that uh, just like the civil rights movement in the U.S., the way they addressed their issue, it was an issue of how can we recognize the equality of the other. And this for me is the core issue that we need to address here. It's not about land, it's not about who owns what and how much and where they are. It is about how can we recognize Palestinians and Israelis our equal right, responsibility towards each other to be here. And that for me is deeply inherent in the civil rights movement in the U.S. and something to build on. Last question. Uh, thank you both uh, for your presentations, which I appreciated a lot. I have two questions also, one for each of you. Uh, Manfred, you said uh, we're in danger of another Holocaust. And I want to ask you about what you mean exactly. Because in the Holocaust, there was, it was targeted against the Jewish people particularly. And are, are you saying that there's a Holocaust like that that we're in danger of? Or are you talking about a general war in the Middle East? Or who, who is the victim of this potential Holocaust we're facing? My second question to Sammy, um, I thought it was really significant what you said about the fear, the fears of Israelis and, and your approach to try to bring healing to them from that fear based on history. Their fear about the future of, of uh, of that Palestinians want this in general, want the annihilation of the Jewish people or something. And um, I'm just wondering in the, in the face of the reality today, that the way Israelis think about what's going on today, um, that, yeah, that that's a very real fear, at least from that, that some Palestinians really do want that. But with the specter of what we hear from almost daily from Iran, uh, using these kinds of terms that Israel needs to be destroyed and annihilated. And I'm just wondering that, is this something that Palestinian Christians can speak to? And what's, what should be done? What, is, is this something that Palestinian Christians can say? Because I think that this, um, that the Israelis, that there is this real fear. And um, you know, how can this be dealt with from your perspective? Okay, Manfred first. I think I, may, <clears throat> I think I made it clear that there is a, a holocaust that uh, described the situation of uh, uh, killing millions of people, but there is also a holocaust mentality, a holocaust philosophy uh, that uh, I am better than you, uh, I'm, I'm pure, you not, uh, I have more than you do, and I already developed that kind of, that, that kind of uh, uh, power over you. And that's what we have in the Middle East, uh, uh, more than in any other place in the world. And you mentioned Iran, Iraq, you, you mentioned the, the whole Palestine-Israeli uh, war with all the, the, the elements. I don't know where it, will, where it will explode. I don't know, will it be... Uh, Lebanon, or will it be another country, or Iran? I, that I don't know. Uh, but I, I sense whenever I come in this part of the world, uh, someone is, is putting more and more oil into the flame of, of that Holocaust mentality. One wants to be over the other, and control the other, and put power and pressure on the other. Um. As a Palestinian, and this is where I say that nonviolence should not be an option, but the only option, and it is for this purpose. The Palestinian community has had a historic 
and long-term understanding even of nonviolence. So this is not a theory that we are trying to bring in uh, into the Palestinian community. My uncle Mubarak, who's sitting with us, was actually deported in 1998 because of his work in nonviolence. And until this day, he cannot return and live here as a Palestinian. He has to come as a tourist to his own land, to his own home. And the reason why I say nonviolence is the only option, because for me, it begins to address this argumentation of we have to do this out of fear and we have to do this out of security. I believe that every single act of violence done by Palestinians towards Israelis is immediately spread within Israeli society who are already at a high level of trauma to start with as, oh, this is what we were talking about to you in Auschwitz. And this is what we're talking about. These are the signs. These are the examples. So even if it was a militant act against the military base, I say we should not uh, endorse or accept such acts. Uh, and it is not easy uh, for us as an organization. Uh, we are very practical in this work. We do engage with Palestinians, Christians and Muslims. Most of those who we address and train in nonviolence within the Palestinian community are Muslims. Uh, we've done training with Hamas as well, because it is very important for us to approach them, not again even label them uh, as an enemy. And at this time we are seeing, the time you are here, we're seeing more Palestinians engage in acts of nonviolence and resistance than any time since the first uprising. To the point where, I don't know if you've been following media, Israeli political officials are threatening the Palestinian Authority, the leadership, that if they don't do something to stop the protests that are taking place where the wall is being built or land is being confiscated or olive trees are being uprooted, then they will do something to punish the Palestinian Authority itself. So this is, this is for me, the power uh, of nonviolence. And the same when it comes to Iran. Uh, I do not agree and I think it is the responsibility of the Palestinian community, not just the Christian community, to have a very strong stand in and a very critical stand of not allowing our cause for justice and human rights to be used and abused by outside forces for their own political and ideological needs and desires. And this is what I feel is happening in Iran. This is my personal opinion on this and it completely misrepresents us. It puts us again in this position of the apologetic position. Instead of being proactive, now we have to react uh, to these statements. Uh, at the same time, I want to say, as Christians, and this is, I'll just end it with a question, how do we, as the evangelical Christian community, engage with Iran and with all the statements in Iran, in that voice, where we are told to love the enemy and bring peace and reconciliation between humanity. With that question, would you thank our panel? <laughs> so thank you, Steve, for doing an excellent job in moderating uh, this panel. And we have something to present for our speakers, Manfred and uh, Sammy, please. This is, this is just a, a small token for this wonderful, wonderful experience we had uh, this uh, afternoon. But what a, you know, I mean, I, I know you appreciate them very much. And this is just to say we appreciate you and we thank you.